Gun Rights Radio Network has the best pro-Second Amendment, pro-gun rights podcast available on the net. The podcasts are absolutely free when subscribing using iTunes or Zoom Marketplace. Or if you want, you can just listen from the website. Make sure you visit GunRightsRadio.com to subscribe. Podcasting freedom, one episode at a time. So welcome back to Power Factor. I'm Steve. I'm Rick. So today we're going to talk about lube maintenance and cleaning. Specifically, what capabilities you should have for lube, clean, and maintenance while at the range. At the range, yeah. When you're at home, of course, you got access to all of the crap in your garage, your you know, auto maintenance. You've seen my garage. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, but we, we're uh, kind of following on our range bag episode, what stuff should you have at the range? And we're going to specifically address those items that would probably need maintaining, might need maintaining at a range, and uh, kind of the, the level of equipment you should have, the uh, minimum level of equipment you should have to be able to keep your gun running after you've arrived at the match. Right. So when we did the range bag episode, we kind of briefly glossed over the fact that we carry um, basically a, a parts kit or a maintenance kit or whatever. So I think today we're really going to be diving into these and kind of explaining what we carry, why we carry it, um, basically, and some other things. So Yeah, and I, I would say that a lot of stuff that you have in there goes beyond what you would probably have to do um, at a local level. But you could take that on the road with you and do more extensive maintenance True. than most people would probably ever need to do. Yeah, I mean, I, I along the lines of, I mean, I don't really know from a local level to a major match or whatever. I just like to have, like, one parts kit. And yes, there are things that I'm carrying really, here. Really big parts Yeah. Kit. Things that I'm carrying here that may not apply to a local level, but yeah, again, I'm not having to switch things around. So. Here's my parts kit. <laughs> yeah, so. Mine's bigger than yours. Yeah, well, in this case, <laughs> in this, this specific case, yes, it is. But this is actually my parts box. This contains only gun parts, and I do have tools and stuff scattered about my range bag in, in a, a less uh, anal fashion than Steve. But we're just going to go over the stuff that we not, not the bag. <laughs> We're going to go over the stuff that we have in our bags and kind of justifying what we have and what we leave at home. But this is part of your maintenance it and is, cleaning. It is. It's is probably, the mag- in terms of the... Uh, it's probably what I use more than anything else exactly. in my bag in terms of maintenance cleaning other than yeah. my gun rag um, yeah, the mag is brush my is mag brush. Much. And granted, I'm not using it very often uh, because of the fact that, I mean, you know, 10 versus 20 to you yeah. um, or me. But at any rate, so that is part of, of my cleaning... Uh, arsenal is my mag brush. So. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, okay. Fire away. Okay, so I carry a uh, multi-bit screwdriver, and in here I have different various uh, screw bits. Multi-bit screwdriver. <laughs> yeah, but do you have Torek? I don't have. Because I have Torek and you don't. So Screwdriver. Yeah. One of the problems, if, if I may, with a lot of the modern guns, like, if you look at a 1911-style pistol as adopted by the government, you can take it completely apart without any tools. True. Cartridge rim serves as a screwdriver to take the grip screws off. Um, the firing pin, pin serves, serves as a punch the, to punch right. out the pins. Right. You buy a modern 1911, it's probably got four different sizes of Allen keys yeah. required to take it apart. Right. So when you're looking at you know kind of how you functional your gun is and thinking, okay, I've got to maintain this on the range... I can maintain my gun with this. I don't need any bits. I don't need any interchangeable anything. I don't have to have five different sizes of Allen keys uh, because this will do the trick. Which is interesting you mentioned Allen keys because I have, I don't have five different sizes no, of Allen keys. No, I have at least 20 different sizes of Allen keys, which maintains my gun, my belt, my shooting belt, um, sights. I mean, everything is on here. I have the ability to drift sights if I want to. Uh, I have a brass, quarter-inch brass punch that I carry in here. Now, this is this is stuff we're talking, you're far from home, and yes. your sights got yeah. banged against something. Right. This isn't, I'm going to be adjusting my sights every week. No, this, I mean, I literally can do anything to my gun anytime, anywhere with what I'm carrying in my right. range bag. Right. And then some, probably rebuild your car, too, and change oil while I'm at it, but at any rate. So I, I keep a whole entire plethora of, uh, of Allen wrenches and punches and... and drift, sight, hoo-ha, things in here like that, just in case I needed to do something, I have the ability to do it. So, And then in terms of a hammer, I don't carry a hammer, but my screwdriver, you can see all the chip marks in here where I have pounded on it to drive out mainspring housing pins or whatever the case may be. 
um, but it, it serves very well as that purpose also. So, but anyway. Now, one thing that I have that I never without, you maybe don't have, is a bushing wrench. Do you carry no. a bushing wrench? I do. That's, it's, I mean, it's one of the things that I consider a tool that I carry with me, probably other than my little <clears> screwdriver. <throat> it's probably the tool that I use the most. If for some reason you have to pull your gun apart at the range, uh, and you've got a bushing barrel in your 1911, it's pretty handy to have. Uh, I wouldn't leave home without it. And see, that's the other thing is that I have basically everything in here to maintain three different guns. My STI, my 1911, and my Glock. Right. So regardless of what gun I'm shooting, I have basically what I would define as everything in my parts kit to be able to maintain each of those guns. You primarily are only shooting 1911, so that's really yeah. all you need to maintain. So obviously your your, your like parts, kit is your smaller. kits is a lot smaller than what I'm carrying. Right. So in terms of the really, you know, small parts, I carry... Uh, a fitted extractor. Now explain fitted when we talk about okay. fitted parts. So in terms of my STI, um, standard extractor started out polishing the hook here, getting the correct relief angle on it, making sure the overall uh, length is correct, that it's not hanging out the back, even went to the, the point of polishing the back of the extractor so it looks like a uh, you know, nice and shiny. Um, so it's the sun, right? You on a hot day, right? Yeah. So everything that I'm carrying is basically designed to be drop in, drop I, in after having been previously previously fitted. fitted. So I have a, a firing pin, for an example. Now how do you fit a firing pin? Well, well, in this case here, the issue with a firing pin is that it needs to freely travel through a. Again, I have it here. In fact, I should just dump this out. A firing pin stop. So if my firing pin stop breaks or whatever, I can replace that. If my firing pin breaks, whatever reason, I can replace that. But the key thing here is that this freely spins on the, or in the firing pin stop. When I initially got this, it did not do that. It binded in the firing pin stop. So I knew that if I went to a match that had a failure, I couldn't just drop this in and make it work. It would stick and I would have a problem. So right. You really got to make test these things in advance. Everything is tested in advance to make sure that it literally is drop-in. I don't have any time at the range to go and fiddle trying to file parts or anything like that. If I have a failure, I want to be able to drop it in, replace it, get it up and going, and be able to start shooting immediately after it fails. So I have basically a sear spring that has, for the most part, been tuned to give me the correct pull on the on the primary and secondary, or I should say the, uh, the sear um, uh, leaf and the disconnector leaf. Uh, to make sure that it's tuned correctly. So, again, all my parts, I kind of am a firm believer of making sure that everything is ready to go as is, as opposed to having to do anything at the range to them. Yeah, and I have mostly the same stuff in my little parts kit here. Um, it's part, I, I select um, the parts that I'm likely to need are either parts that might break or parts that might get lost. So, for instance, while your, if let's say your extractor breaks and I have broken an extractor during a match that I needed to replace, it's distinctly possible that when you pull the firing pin stop off to get the extractor out, right. you could lose your firing pin and firing pin spring. I mean, it's like you think, okay, what I need is an extractor, yeah. but uh, you think in like, the process well, of getting there, I yeah. need to change my recoil spring. Right. So if in the process, you eject your recoil spring plug into the bushes. Yeah. So if you think, okay, I need to change my recoil spring, also think I better have an extra plug if I'm going to change my spring. If I'm going to change my extractor, I better have an extra, even if my firing pin doesn't break, mm -hmm. if I lose the firing mm -hmm. pin, stop trying to uh, service my extractor or my firing pin. So think about all the kind of interrelated parts, like same thing with your magazine release. The only part, 1911 part, other than an extractor hook that I've ever broken while shooting is that little tab on the magazine release okay, lock right. that holds the mag release in. Well, if that little lock uh, breaks and you go to service it, replace the lock, you could lose the little spring. True. You know, and if and, and if the lock breaks, the magazine release is free to fall out of the gun. Yeah. And so, you know, you have to kind of think. Two steps, you know, it's not just the part that I'm going to replace. But, but it's all the parts, parts you're going through to get there. Right, yeah. and so while yeah. most people probably don't carry a single magazine release lock in their spare parts kit, because I've actually broken one, I carry yeah. like five of them, because yeah. I, I just feel like it's, you know, it's a karmic kind of a thing. I better have at least one. Um, but I also carry a lot of these parts that even though they've never failed, I can imagine I could lose one while trying to fix something else. Going for something else. Yeah, yeah. so, and I've also got a magazine follower... Um, a bushing, although I don't know that I'd actually want to put it in any guns. Uh, it's one of those parts that it should be fitted, but if I absolutely had to, I could drop this one in. The inside diameter is small enough, and 
the outside diameter or the inside diameter is big enough, outside diameter is small enough that it'll fit in any gun I own. Right. And so if necessary, if I broke a bushing and needed a bushing just to get the gun back into action, it's not fitted to any It may not be the ultimate gun. bushing, but it'll work. Yeah, but it'll fit in any, any yeah, of the bushing guns that are running. Yeah. 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 So along the same lines, I mean, I carry an extra firing pin spring in my kit uh, here. Uh, I have an extractor for a Glock for my Glock 19 just in case something goes there. I have extra um, shock buffers. Uh, I prefer the CP shock buffers over the Wilson shock buffers, uh, just from personal experience. The Wilson ones tend to, like the blue ones here, you have them also tend to break down faster, but the CP ones here, you can see it's kind of the wider one. Uh, they, they seem to last a lot longer. Um, you can get into a big debate about shock buffers, but basically I clean my gun every time I shoot it, so I'm always inspecting my shock buffer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so. Yeah. My take on shock buffers, too, is uh, some guns need a shock buffer and some don't. Um, one of my guns that I shoot most frequently, it will completely uh, destroy a Wilson shock buff in about 250 rounds, which means I'm changing my buff if I want to run one right. every match or two. And uh, the problem with the buff is it starts to come apart. It can actually jam the gun. Right. And so on the gun that I have that eats the buffs, I don't use it because I'm afraid that it's going to cause more problems than it solves. Now, another gun that I shoot fairly regularly, after a 1,000 rounds, the buffer still looks pretty much like new. Mm -hmm. So that gun obviously doesn't need a buffer. I mean, the whole point of the buffer is that it's absorbing the, the beating rather than the gun taking the beating. But if the buffer is lasting a 1,000 rounds, there's no beating. So I say, why risk the problem of the buffer coming apart if there's no evidence that the buffer is actually doing anything? So. Actually, the whole point of a buffer is not, in my mind, so much about the beating of the gun. It actually changes the recoil of the gun. And what I mean by that is, and this gets into physics, but there's something called an impulse force. And an impulse force is basically force over time. I thought we were going to save this for the impulse force episode. <laughs> <laughs> and briefly, what a shock buffer does is that it, it, it slowly decays the force of the slide coming to a stop over a longer, longer period of time as opposed to the, the slide slamming against the frame. So by decaying that time decreases the impulse force. The force is the same, but this per the period of time that it's spread over is longer and changes the recoil feel or impression to the shooter. So that to me is the reason why you actually run shock buffs, not to, ooh, too much math, <laughs> not to really protect the frame, oh. and they do do that. And now, it's some really, people kind of follow on that. Some people put two or three buffs in. I have, it also changes the yes, timing of the gun. Yes, it does. You can short stroke a gun, intentionally short stroke a gun by, by stacking them up. And I've run two before, actually, to attempt to short stroke a gun to do that. To but see that can affect reliability it, because it's exactly some because of the all of a sudden available for right, heating and ejection. And because of the amount of travel the slide would normally do of hitting the ejector, it may not you know fully hit that thing like it normally would. So yes, you can start inducing failures with the gun. So let's so, just say the jury is out on the benefits and possible downsides of using the shock buff. That same jury is also deciding the full-length guide rod while we're speaking about yes, that, but that's a different yes, story. Yeah, exactly. We'll take that up in right. the, uh, the physics episode. The full-length guide rod slash, yeah, uh, we're shock the, buffer. We're going to do the right. enhancements episode. Right. So the other thing I also carry is replacement fiber optic. Uh, for uh, I like to shoot fiber optic front sight, so I have replacement fiber optic. I have blue. I'm sorry, I have uh, green and red, and then I have a lighter to be able to basically um, replace the fiber optic because it needs to be. Wow, that's big. What I find <laughs> is that I can actually make part of my match fees back by selling pieces of fiber optic rod. Yeah, I bet you can. Yeah. And to people who don't. And granted, this stuff doesn't break very often, but um, that's yeah. And we although this we, it's a little far afield from the topic here. The, the fiber optic rod being some kind of a, a real weak link in the system of your gun sighting. And, oh, God, I don't want to have to replace that rod all the time. What happens if it breaks? What happens if it falls out? I've had one fall out in six yeah. or eight years of competition. Right. And it's not like it takes the whole front sight with it. The little rod falls out. You put a new little rod in, and it's it's not a big deal. You know, I'd I probably wouldn't use the fact is fragile, which it right. really isn't. I no. would certainly not use that argument against the fiber optic site. And if your fiber optic is breaking every match that you shoot, you probably don't have it installed correctly. You probably have too much slop where the slide moving back and forth is literally thrashing your fiber optic site. You need to replace it correctly because it should not move uh, in the front sight. So 
Um, I have a basically a toothbrush for scrubbing out dirt, crap, and other things like that. I think you have something similar to that. Yeah. Uh, I carry a single replacement uh, recoil spring um, that has been fitted for the correct length. How do you fit a recoil spring? That is another episode in itself, but basically um, you need to remove, what you basically do in a nutshell is you remove the spring from the gun. You put two pieces of tape on the, one piece of tape on the slide, one piece of tape on the frame. Pull the slide back all the way, put a vertical mark between the slide and the frame to see the full travel of the slide on the frame. Without the spring. Without the spring. So that's the full, just the mechanical. That's the full limit length, that the right. Slide can right, move right. On the frame. Right. Put the recoil spring in, pull the slide back, and make sure those two lines line up. Right. If they do, the spring is not going into spring bind or full compression. If they don't, that means the spring is going into spring bind or full compression, which means the slide is actually, I'm sorry, you're, you're going to spring bind. The, the slide is not going to full travel. And what happens there, at least in a 1911, is you end up breaking the two ears off of your, um, your barrel bushing. Right. So in my STI, it's a little bit different of what happens, but at any rate, so this, this spring has been checked for length to make sure that it is, again, a drop-in replacement. Um, I like to use ISMI springs over a lot of the other ones, so. I'm also using IMSI recoil springs in most of my guns. Yeah. Uh, I also carry a replacement uh, full length guide rod for my STI. This one happens to be made out of titanium, I'm sorry, not titanium, out of um, tungsten, very heavy. Uh, I used to run this in my gun, but has sw since switched to, switched to a standard steel full-length guide rod. But again, this it serves now as a backup more than anything that if something broke, uh, I have that as a replacement. I also carry a couple of squib rods, uh, which are just simply Delrin, uh, one for 40, one for 9 millimeter, that if I do get a squib, I can pound that out uh, of the gun. So. Steve and I are helping with our uh, IPSC 101 class. One of the most fun parts of the day is when Rick conducts his taping seminar. Uh, it, there's actual art to taping. Um, you've got a target that's been filled with holes. This is actually the 100 yard sight in target that Steve and I were using earlier. And you'll notice that some holes are well away from the scoring perforations. Some are close to the perf and some actually are breaking the perf. And what you're trying to do from the perspective of especially the range officer who's trying to keep score on the target is place the tape so it doesn't obscure those scoring zones. You see on this side we've got tape that completely blocks the perforation. It's almost impossible to score that part of the target. Up here we've got a perfect opportunity when taping these holes to preserve the perforation. Look at that. Look at that. If you, if Instead, I put the tape on. Now this tar this this hole's a little bit closer to the edge. Um, you'll probably have to obscure the perforation, but you'll notice if I put the tape that way, now I've just obscured that part of the perf there. So if it's possible to tape it without doing so, put the tape running parallel to the perforation to help preserve that line to make it easier score. The target will last longer. Everybody will be happy. Um, it looks better, shows up better on camera. It's awesome. So there we go. We're just taping away like that. This one here, pretty close to the perf. We'll just tape it like that, preserve that perforation. Makes everybody happy. The match goes a lot smoother. Uh, okay, so, and I also carry a small screwdriver uh, in addition to my larger screwdriver because uh, I don't have a bit that small. So, now what screw would that fit? Something that teeny? The that magazine fit? spring. Magazine uh, catch release spring. Okay. Which, you know, you were talking about things breaking. Yeah. And all the time that I've been shooting, I have only had one part break at a match while shooting, and that was an extractor in 1911. Yeah. Nothing else has ever broken for me. Yeah. The, um, now, my, although I'm not a Glock guy, I have shot a Glock before. There is a specific Under spring. Under protest. Yeah, right. There's a specific spring in the Glock trigger mechanism that's a, that my understanding is kind of the weakness There's two. in the Glock. There's two springs. Uh, what are they? What should you have with you? Wow, look, there's a magazine catch spring. Uh, so there are two springs. One is the return spring, which I have in here, right here. This is the return spring uh, that is connected to the trigger bar that is effectively trying to pull this, the trigger back of the gun. That's one that can break. 
The other one is a, uh, basically it's the, the lock spring that, for the Glock, you get the, the bar that the you pull down, down, the takedown bar, whatever right. you want to call it. But it's, a, it's a slide lock. In fact, it, not slide lock as the one on the side, but a slide lock literally in the front that prevents the slide from coming off. If that spring breaks, your slide will come right, literally off the front of the gun. So mm -hmm. that's the other spring that's probably the Achilles heel of a, of a Glock that would be most likely yeah. to break. So I, those factory parts? Yes. Is there any advantage to buying... Is there any aftermarket part that's supposed to be any better? Or Not to or my knowledge. Different? I mean, these are pretty much just garden variety, like screws. I mean, in terms of, of a 1911, these are just your standard, you know, factory Glock return spring and slide lock spring. And I keep a stock Glock 19 extractor because of my, and I also have a, a Glock uh, recoil uh, spring assembly that I keep now for the that. guide rod, the, the stock Glock guide rod is some sort of high-tech polymer. You we say so. usually call plastic. <laughs> uh, the only Glock part, I mean, I have fairly limited. I probably have no more than 1,000 rounds total on Glocks, but I have broken one of those guide rods before. You're kidding. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and so the, the little <laughs> cap on the end cape broke off. Yeah. So that's a part that I, I don't know that that's a, a characteristic weakness, but you should, if you're going to carry the whole unit, it, you might as well, rather than say just a spring or just a rod. Okay, so, so some people, I mean, some people will go and, and, mess with the spring on the Glock. And to get the spring off the guide rod, you have to pop the little plastic hoo-ha off right. the end here. That's what I was getting at. You might so well just carry it as a unit. My guess is the reason gun. yours broke is that somebody, may, depending on what gun it was, um, was they may have 20. been messing with the spring on it, and they probably were. Right. Uh, if this was, was Tom? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> so at any rate, that's probably the reason why I broke. That's why it very much surprises but, but me that you said that that broke. If, if you're going to carry the rod and carry the spring, you might as well have it assembled as it's a unit complete like assembly. Just drop it right in. It costs like I don't know six, eight bucks something like yeah. that for a new replace, new rod spring assembly. So yeah, they're cheap. Okay. As yeah. in everything else in the Yeah. <laughs> cheap to make anyway. Right. Right. And cheap to sell. Uh, I also carry, not that this is turning into the Glock episode, but a Glock takedown tool. This is the only thing you need to knock all the pins out is that. So. Right. And do you have to take the, like, the Glock armors course to get one of those? Or do you come in Cracker Jack, or how do you, how do you come by one? I get my uh, certification on the web. Uh -huh. Yeah. You can buy the diploma? No. No. You okay. can just get the Glock armors. So it's like a Glock degree from Pacific Northwest No, it's, 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 okay. your grandmother could be a Glock armor. I, she she, she probably be, is. She yeah. <laughs> Okay, so what else? Now, we've kind of covered parts replacement and tools. What about kind of if your gun is, is running and you want to keep it running, but it's not breaking, what kind of stuff do you think we should have? Well, in terms of keeping it running, uh, I have oil. <laughs> okay. And that's literally, I mean, uh, you know, uh, really all I need. I use, I, as strange as it sounds, there's a lot of, uh, I'm not going to use the term snake oil out there in terms of gun lubes, but there are just tons of gun lubes that are out there available for, for gun-specific Uses I use Mobile One, mm -hmm. uh, synthetic oil. Some people, so people use uh, auto transmission fluid. Right, ATF. You know. Yeah, yeah. I, th fluid. I think that the, the, I've started. I was using you know the the oil that came in my Montgomery Ward's twenty two cleaning kit that I got for Christmas in nineteen seventy one, and I've used various oils, all gun oils at this right. point. Right. And I, by far, I think that the, the the thing that has come to the front in my experience is it's not important so much what you use but is that you use, use enough of it right. and you use it in the right place. Right. And so, um, you know, when somebody just goes raves on and on about a lube, I just, I wonder what were you using before? Right. You know, I mean, it's yeah. just like if this lube is dramatically better than your old lube, what kind of lube were you using? Or I mean, I change lubes. Lube. I find that there's a different label on the bottle, but I mean, my gun runs, um, I just, I, I, I'm stuck right now on Wilson Ultima lubes. Um, which have been reformulated. Apparently, there's a new Ultima Lube 2 out, and I'll probably give that a try. But I might give some completely other lube a try instead if I'm going to change because uh, I've had great experiences pretty much with all the lubes. I just haven't seen a dramatic difference. So if you've got gun lube or a lube that's you're happy with it, it's probably fine as long as you're putting it in the right places, in the right corners. And the beauty of the Mobile One is, I mean, you can buy a quart bottle of Mobile One, and it's going to last you a lifetime probably. So. Yeah. So when you lube your 1911, describe what you lube on your 1911. Uh, older kind of uh, old technology steel guns, and I would say that's 1911, Browning High Power, some of the CZ derivatives where you've got all these metal parts. Um, I will generally, as, as I'm assembling the gun, if I've 
detailed stripped it and cleaned every component, um, I'll generally put a little bit of grease on components that are not accessible mm -hmm. while the gun is assembled. Um, I generally detail strip and clean my gun about once or twice a year. So I want some lube on those parts that's going to stay in there. So that would be like things like the, um, the hammer pin, sear pin. Right. Um, you know, put a little grease on the sear sides nose, of those. Sear nose. Hammer hook. Yeah, hammer hooks. All those parts that are right. inside the gun that are right. going to stay in the gun. Right. Grease goes on there. Um, and then the external parts of the gun that I can reach when it's field stripped and will be maintained on a more regular basis, I put oil on that. So that would be the slide and frame rails for the slide, slides on the frame. The exterior of the barrel where it runs inside the bushing, the top of the exposed part of the barrel where the slide runs over it. Barrel hood. Barrel hood. I usually yeah. put a little spot on the disconnector rail right. that the, that runs over the hammer and the disconnector. Mm -hmm. um, and those parts, because they're readily accessible, um, you know, you don't have to lube them for keeps. You just lube them for today. And I'll generally lube them prior to the match. Um, either the night before or even after I've arrived at the range. And then after the match, I generally wipe off all of that stuff that I can reach and then reapply it. So I'm, I'm, I'm adding lubricant uh, each time I go to the range, um, but I'm not uh, cleaning it and starting over each time. So that, that kind of reduces the amount of lubing that you need to do, but I always do the same point. Steve's laughing because he's... Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> okay. So let so you're into Formula One racing, right? I am. Yes. So do you suppose that Lewis Hamilton, as an example, after he finishes a race, tells his pit crew, "Just go ahead and wash the car, and it's okay. You don't need to bother about changing the oil or turning the engine down or doing any of the other maintenance or stuff like that. Just wash the car and wipe it down, and that's good." No, I think probably he, not. I think he huh? probably tells him, "Hey, go get me a beer. Uh, <laughs> my socks are dirty. Uh, can you give me a Kleenex and a Q-tip?" And then he doesn't really give a damn. You don't think so? You, you know, you, we're talking you, specifically Lewis Hamilton. You know? yeah, yeah, well, or in no, the other. I, you know, I think uh, there's different philosophies on, on the, the cleaning. But see, this is competition, and then competition, well, you want your equipment to run 100%, okay. and you don't want to take a chance okay. of any fouling or anything basically spoiling your game. Right. So my thought is, yes, maybe you don't need to, but okay. why not? Right. I mean, why? So why? Do, they, do they tear the car down and clean it after every lap? I don't know. I'm not in a formula one <laughs> thing. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. But, but you see, they wait my, until the end of the race, and, and the I, car is designed to run a full race distance. And my guns are designed to run a whole entire match to run well, without. See, my gun, my gun runs for six months worth of matches before it needs to be torn down. So Rick and I obviously have a different philosophy, but from my standpoint, I like to make sure that all my equipment is at top notch and ready to go. Mine is top notch. In the terms of its construction and materials, and, and dirty. so it doesn't need all that excessive and dirty. On my, my yeah. point out. So after any time I shoot, whether it's one round or a hundred rounds or three hundred rounds or whatever, I will clean my gun. And when you say clean, oh, I will clean field it. Strip. Field strip. Though. Field strip it. Yeah, right. Exactly. Right. So I will field strip my gun and clean it. I mean, clean it. <laughs> yeah. uh, in terms of a detail strip, probably maybe two thousand, every two thousand rounds or so, give or take, maybe two. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I field strip my gun probably every 1,000 rounds and detail strip it every 3,000 to 5,000 rounds. Well, at least we got that part similar. Yeah, I mean, that, and that works out to being annually or semi-annually. Like, if I were going to go to a big match, like we're going to go to a double tap championship in June, right? I will probably detail strip my gun and clean it before that match, regardless of how long it's been prior, before it was cleaning, to well, start off. Well, that part is true between the two of us because I will clean my gun next weekend because we're shooting a match, and then I'll yeah. clean my gun the following weekend because yeah. we're shooting a match. Yeah, see, I'm going to shoot a match next weekend and not clean my gun, right. then I'll shoot the yeah. probably two weeks after that and not clean it, and then maybe... Clean uh, your gun after yeah. every match. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if your gun is malfunctioning... You know, if, if you ever have a clean. Formula One team and you're my pit crew, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. you won't exactly. be for very long, so right. at okay. any rate. All right. Okay. Well, in terms of lube, what I do... Um, is when I'm moving my guns, I take the slide off, I put a drop in each of the corner of the rails and let it go down the slide rail. Mm -hmm. uh, I will lube the top of the disconnector, I will drop uh, a couple of drops of oil down, pull the hammer back, drop it down there in the hammer and the sear. Uh, I will put a drop on, basically, if I pull or tilt the gun back and look down the mag well from the top, I'll put a drop down there where I can see the disconnector okay. moving on the pin. Right. 
Um, I will put a little bit of my finger and run it down the barrel, similar to what you were doing. I'll mm -hmm. put a drop on the two um, upper and one lower um, barrel uh, lugs. How do you get oil on the lower barrel lugs? Well, I took the barrel out. Oh, okay. All yeah. Right. All right. Yeah. Okay. So, so we're talking so the, the, strip. Basically, okay. the, yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Right. So, right, field stripping the gun. Uh, and that it's been so long since I field stripped mine that I forgot, forgot about, about the barrel out yeah. of it. When, yeah. yeah. Right. 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 So at any rate, that's that's pretty much. And then what I'll do is actually with the barrel out of the gun and the slide, I'll put the slide on and reciprocate it a few times and distribute that sure, oil sure. through um, throughout the gun to the, the, the rails. Mm -hmm. And then I'll put the barrel back in and uh, put it all together. And I and, uh, see when I want to lube the lower barrel lugs, I just rack the slide back, stick the oiler in there, and squirt enough in that it runs all the way down the barrel and drips on the link and stuff. And on your finger. That's why you're so fast. You've got a slippery trigger finger. Right. We finally figured it out. They don't call them their burner for nothing. So, right. yeah. Right. Okay. So, okay. So now we've gotten uh, kind of the general maintenance, general lube. Uh, I'm looking at my little container here. See what else I have. I have a couple of cleaning patches. I mean, if you need to wipe something off. Um, one of the things at this a range a facility, rag. you can't count on there being any kind of a clean surface to put that's the gun on. And that's another good reason to have your... If you've got a towel, you might want to, like I use often use my brass bag as a kind of a towel. Like if I'm going to do some, tear a magazine apart or something, the bench isn't necessarily clean. I've got a cloth uh, canvas uh, uh, brass bag, and I'll put that down and know it's fairly clean so I'm not adding, you know, pine needles and, you know, ant body parts and stuff as I'm trying to clean the thing. And where do you go to clean it? Match. Oh, safety area. Very good. Yeah. House. Yeah. Okay. So what else we have? Well, any other any other secrets? Give a secret. Something that you think, boy, you know, this is a tip that would turn like a, an unclassified shooter into a C class shooter overnight. Clean you your just gun have... every match. <laughs> <laughs> Don't waste your time cleaning your gun. You're wearing your gun out by cleaning. It's uh, like well, you don't wear out like... your clothes wearing it. You wear out your clothes tumbling it through the washing machine. So Why don't... it's the same thing with the gun. Yeah. Taking it apart and putting it together. You just, you just put it, I didn't know how to wear it to a thing. It just doesn't need it. Well, my guns are made out of putty like yours are. Right. Yeah. Okay. What else? Anything else? Is that it? I, I mean, in that terms of what, everything that I have now? in my, yeah, we, we beat okay. that to death. I, I, pretty much everything that I have in my little toolkit here. I have earplugs in here just in case I lose my earplug or you need a pair or your friend needs a pair, right. or his friend needs a pair, right. or his friend needs a pair, I have your plugs. Well, that's good. Well, yeah. I got a bore snake. I haven't used it yet. That's a good idea for when you go to a, a major match. I mean, obviously, you don't have the ability to, and we don't. I mean, we pretty much change our philosophy when we go to a major match in terms of cleaning. Yeah. At least I do, because I don't have my whole entire cleaning set with me. I don't use a bore snake. I probably something I ought to get. Um, but in terms of a major match, I mean, yeah, I'll tear my gun down, field strip it, and wipe it down. Well, and, re and, of course, the beauty I of the I take your snake, approach, basically, for major matches. The beauty of the boar snake is you get to clean the gun without taking it apart. You right. don't add that extra wear yeah. to taking it apart. <laughs> but it's nice. I mean, the one nice thing about it, the thing, the reason that I bought it, that I thought was made it especially clever, is that it feeds in from the breech end of the barrel. Right. And so I, I, like, I knew a guy uh, whose gun was knocked over into the sand. So it's laying there in the sand. Well, if you've got junk in the barrel, you can clean it from the breech end and pull all of that stuff out the front. You don't have to take the gun apart. Otherwise, you'd have to pull the gun apart to get access to the breech with a rod or something. Yeah. So for a quick clean, you know, or maybe you think maybe you got water in the barrel or something, you can drag it through there. And, again, I haven't used it, but... Uh, seems like a pretty slick way to go for just a little quick. That is a good idea, especially for the major matches when you need to do something like that. Or just do a spot cleaning, so to speak, that night where you want to make sure everything's clean. Yeah. That's a good way to do it. So, Anything else? I think that pretty much covers it. Okay. Well, that's it for maintenance and cleaning at the range. <laughs> okay. So, uh, again, you can hit the uh, website at powerfactorshow.com. Uh, send us an email. Tell you all about cleaning, powerfactorshow at gmail.com. And if you want to contact me at powerfactorshow at gmail.com, I'll tell you how you can make, you know, like not cleaning your gun for fun and profit. It's a yeah. special correspondence course I've started. Okay, Lewis. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks Bye. again. We'll see you next week. <laughs>